Welcome. Thanks for watching today. Uh, we're currently in week number two of our summer series on uh, Empowered by the Spirit. And uh, in this series, we are looking at that small band of believers in Jerusalem who were left with a mission to spread the gospel. And we're focusing in on those days between uh, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, up through the ascension of Jesus, and on to the day of Pentecost. Um, between the time that Jesus ascended and the time that the Holy Spirit came upon them. Our text for this series is found in the first chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. Now last Sunday in our first message of this series, we barely got through the first verse of verse 1 of Acts chapter 1. And today may sound a little bit like an Easter message, but if we are to preach Christ and Him crucified, then every sermon ought to sound like an Easter sermon. So let's read our text together this morning in Acts chapter 1. I want to begin again at verse number 1, and uh, we're, we're going to read the first three verses. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1. The former account I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles, whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Back in 1939, there was a scientist by the name of Leo Slizard, who was a, a, a Hungarian. And they described him as kind of an eccentric, uh, kind of a charming little guy, and he had fled Hungary during the war. He was a physicist, and when the Nazis began to take over Europe, he fled to America. In fact, he started working as a researcher at Columbia University. In his research, he realized that a process that some of his colleagues were developing called nuclear fission, and he realized that if they took that process and they applied it to uranium, that it could theoretically, it, it could set off a potentially unbelievable explosive chain reaction. And as he began to think about uh, the implications of all of that. And so he went down the hall and he talked with his friend Eugene Wagner. Now Eugene was also a Hungarian physicist and as those two men talked they began to realize that this was a lot bigger than the two of them. It was bigger than Columbia University. And so they knew that they had to share this with someone else. And they decided to that the one person who would it would be best to share this with was another Jewish refuge from Europe named Albert Einstein. Now they had heard that Einstein was in New York City where they were, and in fact they had heard he was vacationing in a cabin on a lake in upstate New York. So without any further preparation, the two of them jumped in a car and they drove up to this tiny little town up north of the big city. And they didn't know exactly where Einstein was. One of them had met him once before and the other had never met him. And so they just began looking for Albert Einstein. And they saw a little boy who was walking along the road and they stopped and they rolled down the window and they said, do you know where Albert Einstein is staying? And he said, sure, I'll show you. And so he pointed them to the little cabin where Einstein was vacationing. They walked up to the cabin unannounced and they knocked on the door. And when Einstein came to the door, they introduced themselves and they said, there's something that we have to show you. And uninvited, they just walked right on into the cabin. 
and they spent about 15 minutes explaining to Einstein their theory, this chain reaction theory that was based on the work that Einstein had done about 30 years previous to that. And after listening to them for about 15 minutes, Einstein realized that this could have huge implications. In fact, he realized that this could have implications that would change the course of the entire world. So he and Slizzard sat down and they wrote out a letter to then President uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And they said, here's the deal. There are some scientists who are working on something that you need to know about. And that letter led them to the Manhattan Project, which eventually led to the development of the first atom bomb. And that little conference in that little cabin in upstate New York still has implications all these years later, some 80 years later. We're still talking today about other nations getting a bomb. We're talking about North Korea and about Iran, and all of that goes back to these folks in a little cabin in upstate New York. Now, if we go back in time 2,000 years, we meet another group of Jewish men and women, and they have just received information that they realize has implications that could change the course of history. They, In fact, they realize that the information that they have could change mankind as they knew it. And so they had to figure out, what do we do? How do we handle this kind of information? If you look in your Bible, you'll see in the book of Acts, that's where this group of people get together and they begin to deal with this new information, this revolutionary chain reaction power that will change mankind. So that's what we're doing in this series. We are looking at the history and the beginnings of this revolution, and it all begins in Acts chapter 1. On the afternoon of that first Easter morning, we read where Jesus joined with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And we read in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What a message that would have been. During those 40 days before Jesus ascended to heaven, those disciples listened to the Lord, and they listened as he gave his final instructions before ascending to heaven. By the way, Acts chapter 1 verse 3, it's the only place that tells us that the period between the resurrection and the ascension was exactly 40 days. You know, the number 40 seems to have special significance in Scripture. In our own Church of God tradition, the number 40 is seen in the light of uh, symbolic uh, uh, prophetic symbolism as pertaining to the, to the number approving or struggle or, or suffering. Uh, just consider some of the hard things that we read about in Scripture revolving around the number 40. For example, the rains fell 40 days and 40 nights during Noah's flood. Moses was 40 years on the backside of Midian, tending sheep before God spoke to him through the burning bush. Moses also spent 40 days on Mount Sinai as he received the Ten Commandments. The spies, 12 spies, spent 40 days exploring the land of Canaan. A generation wandered in the wilderness, 40 years, one year for each day that the spies uh, spent in Canaan. Uh, we are told that they discouraged Elijah, hid by the brook in Horeb for 40 days as he was fed by the ravens. 
Ezekiel lay on his right side for 40 days to symbolize the 40 years of Judah's transgressions. And Jonah warned Nineveh of coming judgment in 40 days. We know Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. And Jesus appeared to the disciples 40 days after his resurrection. Jerusalem was destroyed by Rome 40 years following the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. Now, 40 is associated with almost each new development in the history of God's mighty acts, especially salvation, when you consider the flood, redemption from Egypt, Elijah in the prophetic era, the advent of Christ and the birth of the church. The number 40 is always associated with those kinds of things in Scripture. When you see the number 40 in Scripture... Pay attention, because it usually means that God is about to do something significant in the world. Christ was tempted for 40 days at the beginning of his ministry, and he appeared to the disciples for 40 days at the end of his ministry. And so we come to these last days of, on earth of Jesus, and for 33 years he has made the earth his home, and now the time draws near for him to leave. We're beyond the cross we're beyond the suffering, we're beyond the torture, the mocking, and even beyond the resurrection at this point. We're in that mysterious 40-day period that we would like to know much more about. Jesus is leaving soon, not to return for at least 2,000 years. No longer does he speak to thousands, but to only a few. To them is entrusted the responsibility to take the message around the world. To them is given the gospel, the good news, the best news in the history of the world. Soon enough, the incredible burden will fall upon their shoulders alone. And if they fail, the Christian movement will disappear before it ever begins. In human terms, the gospel is in their hands. Now, knowing all this, what is it that Jesus talks to them about? Does he talk to them about the weather? Does he talk to them about sports scores? You know, the latest gossip from Rome? No, hardly. He tells that little band of men what they need to know in order to make it after he's gone. See, during that 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension into heaven, he accomplished two important goals. He proved that he was alive, and secondly, he prepared them for the future. Now, we can sum up the lessons from those days and Three simple statements. Here's the statement number one. Jesus Christ really is alive. You know, Luke tells us that he showed himself alive by many convincing proofs. Uh, the King James uses the word infallible proofs. That phrase, convincing proofs, infallible proofs, it comes from a Greek word that's only found in Acts chapter 1 verse 3 in the New Testament. We know from other instances in ancient Greek that this word means to present a case so logically, so airtight, so compelling that it can be com considered as completely proved. In a court of law, this word referred to an argument that was so overwhelming that no other conclusion could possibly be considered. Now, what that means is, and if you talk about infallible proofs, that means that the proof of the resurrection is sure. It is certain. It is unquestioned. It is beyond any doubt. It is a testimony that could stand up in any court of law. Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. That is the most stupendous claim in all of history. Christians believe that a man has come back from the dead. 
I think we sometimes forget how astounding this claim is. Our familiarity with the New Testament, it has dulled our senses to the enormity of what it is that we believe. But Luke says we have infallible proof, something that is even more certain than hearsay, something better than a rumor. We have incontrovertible evidence that Jesus is alive today. You know, for 2,000 years, people have attacked their resurrection in the town uh, on the grounds that such a thing, it's just, it, it just impossible. And various theories have been proposed to explain what happened on that first Easter Sunday. Uh, some skeptics suggest that Jesus died and he is still dead and that the early disciples suffered from mass hallucination. That is... <coughs> They thought he rose from the dead, but it was just a dream or a vision or just wishful thinking. Luke offers three proofs that Jesus rose from the dead. First, he says that Jesus appeared to them. Now, the Greek word for appeared is it means to, to the eye or the eyeball, and we get the modern word ophthalmology, the study of the eye and the treatment of eye diseases from that Greek word. In modern terminology, Luke is telling us that the disciples eyeballed Jesus. They looked him over in great detail. They examined his wounds. They satisfied themselves that it was the same Jesus they had known and loved. Now, the second proof that Luke offers up is that Jesus spoke with them. He talked to them, and he, he told them about the kingdom of God, and he prepared them for his departure. A third thing Luke tells us is that he ate with them. You know, Luke 24 tells us that when he appeared to the disciples in Jerusalem, they were all frightened and thought he was a ghost. And he invited them to examine his wounds and see for themselves that he was real. And what happens next uh, has always seemed a little bit humorous to me. How do you prove that someone has come back from the dead? You know, if you ever find yourself in that situation and somebody walks in the door who was previously dead, uh, here's, here's how they, you know, uh, they can prove to you that they're the same person. All they have to do is ask you for something to eat. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 40 says, When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in his presence, in their presence. You know, a ghost may be able to do many things, but no ghost can eat a Big Mac. <laughs> By eating with them, Jesus proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was alive. Now, over the centuries, many folks have claimed to be the Messiah. You know, several years ago, there was a, a, a rabbi up in Brooklyn, Rabbi Schneerson, whose followers thought he might be the Messiah. Now, he never made that claim himself, but his followers thought so. And after he died, some of his, some of his followers moved to Israel and began suggesting that he might ri rise from the dead. You know, and I, I remember reading about that, and I thought, uh, you know, right idea, wrong man. You know, the real Messiah rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. Now, here are three truths for us to remember about the resurrection. First of all, it is the bedrock of our faith. Secondly, it is the answer to our doubts. And thirdly, it is the reason for our hope. So it's the bedrock of our faith, it's the answer to our doubts, and it's the reason for our hope. And all that we believe is wrapped up into the empty tomb. Jesus is still alive. He is not the one who was, he is the one who is.
Because Jesus is alive, we have a message worth sharing. You know, we go to a home that's breaking up, to a man caught in the grind between pressures at home and pressures on the job, to a woman who is bored with life, who thinks an affair is the only way to grab a little gusto, to a student who feels pushed by her friends to lower her standards, to the lonely, to the confused, to the guilty, to the hurting, to the rebellious. We've got the message that they need. We go with confidence because we have and we serve a living Christ. Now, a second statement about the resurrection we can say is, death is not the end. Death is not the end. For just a moment, let's just stand back and take the four Gospels plus the book of Acts and examine these 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension. Take one scene and add it to another until a composite picture is formed. We see that he restored Peter, who had fallen and and had denied him. We see that Jesus encouraged Mary, who was weeping at the garden tomb that morning. We see that Jesus welcomed Thomas, who was doubting that he was even alive. We see that he instructed two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus also met the discouraged disciples, and he ate with them. He met the disciples on a mountain in Galilee. Uh, He cooked breakfast for the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. And each one of those episodes, it carries its own message, but you put them all together and a portrait appears. And it's the same Jesus. He has the same heart, the same tenderness. Death has not destroyed his personality. It has not rendered him uh, somehow unrecognizable. It is the same Jesus they had known during all those days and months and years that they had spent together. Not some other person and not the same person somehow changed, but the same person that they had known and loved, the same Lord to whom they had committed themselves. Now, perhaps we underestimate this point because we have never met someone who's come back from the dead, but it would not be impossible to imagine that such a person would be so changed by his experience as to be a totally different person. Um, There are, in fact, stories of some people who have been revived on the operating table whose brain lost so much oxygen that they were never able to function again. But when Jesus appeared to his disciples, they were persuaded to believe it was really him, in part because he exhibited the same personality that they had known before. Now, what does that teach us? First, it teaches us the the impotence of death to separate us from Jesus. Though we die, we will live forever with him. Death itself cannot break the bond between Jesus and his people. Secondly, it teaches us the perpetuality of his love. You know, Romans 8, 38 and 39 assures us that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In the list of specific things that Paul goes through and mentions, he says that neither death nor life, which means that when we cross the swelling Jordan, we need have no fear for the same love of Jesus that saved us will see us safely to the other side. Thirdly, we learn from this that human personality survives the grave. Uh, Jesus remembered Mary and Peter, and he's going to remember you and I as well. Not only does his personality survive, so does ours. We shall then be what we are now, only vastly improved by the grace of God. You will be you, 
and I will be me, but freed forever from sin and selfishness and pettiness and bitterness and godly ambition and unholy thoughts and every other ugly accretion that makes us hard to live with now. (laughs) But the real you can survive the grave. Death can do many things, but it cannot destroy the personality. Death is not the end. He showed himself alive after his death, and we too shall show ourselves alive after we have passed through the waters of death. A third statement that we can gain is this. The kingdom of God must be our priority. Acts chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that during his last days on earth, Christ spoke about the kingdom of God. That was the topic that was closest to his heart. In the Gospels, Jesus referred to the kingdom in one way or another about 80 different times. It was clearly the central theme of his earthly teaching. He says in Luke chapter 4 verse 43 that he was sent for the purpose of preaching the kingdom of God. Now, God's kingdom is a vast topic, but it refers to God's sovereign right to rule over the universe. It specifically refers to God's right to establish his rule over this rebel planet we call Earth. Now this concept is rooted deeply in the Old Testament. From the very earliest promises made to Abraham, the kingdom of God was the focal point of all history. God promised Abraham that many descendants would come from him, the Jews in particular, a land for that people, Israel, and a great blessing for the whole world, universal redemption through Jesus Christ. Those promises were made and they were repeated and they were amplified through Moses, through David, through the kings, through the prophets. You know, one of the most spectacular verses in the Old Testament is found in the prophetic words of Daniel in chapter 7. In verse 18 it says, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And the Old Testament ends with the greatest kingdom not yet established on the earth. However, when the birth of the baby Jesus was announced by the angel, we are given this wonderful promise in Luke chapter 1. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus himself preached this truth when he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom was near because the king had come from heaven and come to the earth. And later he remarked that the kingdom of God is within you. And still later in Mark chapter 9 verse 1, And he said to them, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, how much bolder of a statement can he make? There are folks right here, right now, who are not going to die until they see the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus later gives this qualification about the kingdom of God as he's standing before Pilate. And in John 18, 36, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not from here. And with his dying breath on the cross, Jesus uttered those life-giving words that have sent cold chills through the very halls of hell itself. He said, it is finished. What was finished? All of it. Salvation was finished. The kingdom had been established. Sin and death had been accomplished, had been conquered. Jesus' mission was over and his work was done. It is finished. Now, 
there's a lot of, of confusion out there about the kingdom. And here's what we need to know about the kingdom of God. First of all, Jesus set up the kingdom of God completely the first time he came. The kingdom is here and now. Um, if he did not set up the kingdom the first time he came, then by his own word, there still are people walking around who are 2,000 years old who are still alive and still waiting to see the kingdom coming in power. The earthly kingdom of God is not an earthly kingdom. And the doctrine of some future thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, it requires a twisting of Scripture in order to make it all fit. The kingdom has been given to the saints of God. You know, meanwhile, as we pray, we usually say, Thy kingdom come. And each time we pray that, we're asking God to establish his rule in our hearts and then to establish it spiritually in the hearts of those around us. In a sense, every time we share Christ, we're inviting people to become citizens of God's kingdom here on the earth. The kingdom comes each time we submit our hearts to the will of God. That's why Jesus encouraged us to seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all those other things will be added to you. Now what does it mean to seek God's kingdom? To put it in simple terms, we all live in the kingdom of this world. Now, the world, in this sense, refers to the organized system that leaves God out. It's not just that we live on this ball of dirt that we call planet Earth, but ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, all of us have lived in a spiritually hostile environment where the values of the Bible are constantly at odds with the values of society at large. And things aren't getting better, <laughs> they're getting worse. Seeking God's kingdom means consciously rejoicing and, and constantly rejecting the materialism and selfishness of the world in favor of self-sacrifice and compassion. It means choosing to follow in the footsteps of Jesus even when those steps lead to the cross. It means picking up that cross every day and following our master into the crowded streets of hurting world. It means setting aside a career in favor of a mission. It means using your resources to help others instead of storing up silver and gold. It means living as if heaven is the goal of life, not a big salary and a happy retirement. In short, seeking the kingdom of God means putting God first on a daily basis and making your decisions on the basis of God's agenda and not yours. You know, I'm convinced that many folks go through life searching for something that's missing. You go to any bookstore and you can discover shelf after shelf filled with books, with self-help books. And the meaning of life isn't found in some guru's feeble attempt to make a dollar at your expense. The only thing that matters is God. It doesn't matter how long you live. It doesn't make any difference how much money you make or even how well you do in your career. The only thing that matters is God. If you live for 80 years but don't discover that truth, you've missed the very reason for your own existence. If you should rise to the height of your profession but don't learn this lesson discovered, you've wasted your time. If you should earn a million dollars or ten million dollars and have hundreds of friends and the praise of your contemporaries, if you have all that but don't figure on that basic truth, you're still in spiritual kindergarten. See, the only thing that matters is God. Everything else is just details. Your career, 
your education, your fame, your degrees, your money, your accomplishments, your long-range goals, your dreams, your possessions, your friendships. It's all just details. The only thing that matters is God. Figure that out, and you've got it all figured out. Miss that, and you'll spend 75 years mired in endless details. That brings me back to Jesus in his final few days on the earth. He talked about God's kingdom because in the end, God is the only thing that matters. He knew the human tendency to skip the central truth and waste years fiddling with the details. Have you figured out what life is all about? Until you do, you're wasting your days on things that really don't matter. The only thing that matters is God. Everything else is just details. Put your hope and your trust in Jesus. Only he can satisfy your deepest longings in this life. Let's pray together. God, our desire is to build your kingdom and not our own. But we confess most of the time we live like that's not true. We spend so much of our day trying to build our kingdom, making ourselves instead of you the center of this life. Lord, we need your spirit. We need you to remind us minute by minute that this life is not all about us, not all about me, but it's all about you. We confess that our pride and vanity get in the way of your kingdom being built in our lives. We think of ourselves more highly than we should. We pray you will grant us humility. We pray that we would embrace these gifts that you have given to us and use them to bring you glory and not to ourselves. In the end, that will be all that matters. Nothing we build for our own glory will be left. So we ask you to help us stop spending this life focused on ourselves. Jesus, we want to see our daily life through the eyes of your kingdom. Help us to seek your kingdom in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We'll be back this Wednesday night for our online Bible study on the life of the Apostle Paul. We hope that you can join us at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this Wednesday night on Facebook for that online live Bible study. Lord willing, we will be back again next Sunday with part three of this series, Empowered by the Spirit. We are wading through the very first chapter of the book of Acts. We hope that you can join us. If you miss any of the online Bible study lessons or any of the Sunday morning messages, you can check those out on Facebook. You can also go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Uh, just type in Lebanon First Church of God into the search bar, either on Facebook or YouTube, and you should be able to find us. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can log into YouTube and you can actually subscribe to our channel. So check all that out. Thanks again for joining us. May God bless you as you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.